Previously on Rome, rise and fall of an empire. In the late fourth century, endless barbarian attacks poisoned the empire with suspicion and hatred for its own immigrant soldiers. The half-barbarian, half-Roman general Stilicho is not the last to be sacrificed. A bloody death foreshadowing the fate of an empire on the brink of collapse. Now, in the fifth century, over 500 years after the death of Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire is ravaged by war and is quickly losing land to its foreign invaders. In the midst of this chaos, three Roman generals compete for the power of emperor. But through treachery, betrayal, and murder, only one, the barbarian-born Ricimer, gains control of Rome. He is the puppet master. In 455 AD, the ancient city of Rome, once a pinnacle of civilization, is sacked by a violent tribe of Vandal barbarians. Vandals have come from North Africa to the capital of the Roman world, uh, as it used to be anyway. Uh, the Romans are shocked and terrified uh, that barbarians could come to their ancient cultural center and literally take anything that they wanted. After centuries of endless barbarian attacks, Rome has lost control of the Mediterranean. Desperate, the empire offers up its last and greatest treasure, the land itself. In exchange for peace, Rome grants its fertile soil to the barbarian tribes. The problem is that they had no choice. And so the Romans just negotiated with them and said, OK, you're here. We can't get you out. We'll give you this territory. And Romans just gave it away. The empire has been officially divided between east and west for over 75 years. But while the east remains strong, the West has lost most of its territory to the barbarians. As it barters away its land, the empire receives barbarian soldiers in return, but the plan only backfires. The emperors made a deal with the devil, so to speak, because when the emperors gave land to the barbarians, they were giving away whatever tax revenues might come to the imperial treasury from those lands. The more you gave away, the poorer you got. The poorer you got as Roman emperor, the more land you needed to give away. And it was a deadly downward spiral for the strength of the Roman Empire. The empire has always depended on foreign mercenaries. Yet in the 5th century, the Roman army is almost entirely of barbarian descent. The former enemies are now peers. Barbarians, once the slaves of Romans, are now often their superiors. All these men are saying, hey, my parents may have been a barbarian, but I'm not. I'm a general in the Roman army. And they're competing for the honor attached to leadership. Age-old ethnic tensions divide the army, pitting soldier against soldier, Roman against barbarian. But in 456 AD, one ambitious general is determined to maintain order, though he himself is a barbarian. His name is Ricimer. Ricimer's career followed a path that was, was quite normal for barbarian nobles. He was from a minor branch of the Gothic royal family. Uh, he had no real prospect of winning power in his home society, and so he sought service as an officer in the Roman army, where he did very well for himself. Now, Ricimer devises a plan to gain even more power in the Western Empire. He will lead his army against Rome's greatest foe, the Vandals. The problem is, to all intents and purposes, there is no such thing as the Roman army at this time. A commander, whoever he happens to be, sees a threat, then has to raise the army however he can, 
if he has money, then move that army to the location and fight. Rissimer marches to Agrigentum in modern-day Sicily to confront the Vandal forces sailing from their stronghold of Carthage. In Sicily, the Vandal warriors come down hard on Rissimer and his army. The Vandals know their enemy, and they know the terrain. Sicily and southern Italy were like the Vandals ATM. Every spring, they'd get in their ships and row over and make a very violent withdrawal and then go home. And the Roman security cameras couldn't do anything about it. Rissimer leads his troops against the great onslaught of barbarians. Yet despite his own military training, his army of mercenary soldiers is at a disadvantage. The Roman army by the middle of the fifth century is no longer the army that it had been a hundred years before. For one thing, it's considerably smaller. Uh, for another, it's less well armed and it's certainly less disciplined. Consequently, there just doesn't seem to be any, uh, there's no evidence that there's any kind of training or tactics or whatever. It's simply this great whack of Germans is then sent off against that great whack of Germans and they just keep killing one another until either it gets dark or somebody gives up or somebody runs away or you know, whatever, the, whatever the case may be. Though the skill and discipline of Roman formation has been lost for decades, the Vandals are unable to break Rissimer's men. The Roman army claims victory, not for the empire, but for their great leader. The battle-weary Rissimer returns home a hero, but he's not the only general seeking his fame and fortune in Rome. Two old friends from his youth are equally ambitious. Majorian and Agidius. Rissimer, Majorian, and, and Agidius had all effectively been fellow junior officers, and their careers had marched in step with one, and over, with one another over the years. But now it is their innate differences that stir conflict below the surface. The three men reflect the great ethnic divide hindering the empire. I think one of the sources of the obvious personal tension between Agidius, Rissimer, and Majorian really lies in their origins. Agidius is from Gaul, Majorian is from Italy, and Rissimer is a barbarian who wants to live as a Roman. And Rissimer is out to prove that he has as much right to a piece of the empire as any other Roman. But the competition for absolute power in Rome is not limited to Rissimer, Majorian, and Agidius. They must now swear allegiance to a new emperor, Avidus, whose tenuous claim to the throne rests only on his formidable barbarian entourage. It's quite clear that Avidus's regime rested on a foundation of Gothic military support and that the Gothic king was Avitus's most influential and in some ways um, absolutely indispensable backer. With his Gothic bodyguards, Avitus is untouchable. Rissimer and his friends can do nothing but take their orders and wait while the old figurehead enjoys the luxury of power, neglecting the true problems of the empire. In North Africa, Rome's grain supply has been seized by the barbarian vandals. North Africa was the breadbasket of the empire, producing grain, the staple of most people's diets, and olive oil, equally important for the fat in people's diets and for a million other uses. Without the precious grain, famine grips what's left of the empire's provinces. In Rome, the poor must steal what they can to survive. Gone are the security and comfort of Rome's heyday, replaced now by despair and turmoil. 
So everything is topsy-turvy. Uh, there's no stability, there's, there's no sort of knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. Everything uh, is uncertain. The situation at the Imperial Palace soon declines as well. Angry and impatient, Emperor Avedis's Visigoth soldiers demand payment for their services. Avedis is desperate. Roman emperors couldn't pay the barbarian troops that they needed in cash because the Roman Empire's revenues were so greatly decreased. So when Roman emperors were bartering for military support, they were dealing in the only good currency they had left. So Avitus has to strip the bronze off of the temples in order to pay the guys who came down to Gaul with him, all the, 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 Gothic, the Gothic army and, and his Gothic entourage. But by selling the treasures of Rome, Avitus only saves himself. He leaves Italy in the poorhouse. Hungry and hopeless, the Romans riot in the streets, demanding that Avitus banish his Gothic troops from Rome. Avitus is not popular, and he's not popular with the Italian army, and he's not popular with the Italian general, Rissima. In the public's outrage, Rissima and Majorian see an opportunity. Vitus was in a desperate situation, and when the barbarian Roman commander uh, Rissimer decided that Avitus was a losing proposition, uh, Avitus had no uh, choice except to flee. The emperor may flee the chaos of the crowd, but escaping the ambitions of Rissimer will prove to be more difficult. In the fifth century, Rome is overrun by barbarians. Three old friends, the generals Rissimer, Majorian, and Aegidius, maneuver to attain absolute power in what's left of the Western Empire. But first, they must subdue its incompetent emperor, Avitus. Chased out of Rome, Avitus flees over the Alps and westward into his native Gaul, where he gathers Visigothic supporters before returning to Italy. With the support of his fellow Gauls, Avitus hopes to easily regain the throne. But back on Italian soil, Rissimer and Majorian are waiting for him. The ambush is brutal. These battles are up close and personal because you have to be able to kill them from up that close. Uh, so there's pushing, there's shoving, there's running back. There are dead bodies to climb over. There are injured men yelling. In the bloodbath, the army of Avitus is annihilated. But in a surprising turn, Rissimer spares the emperor's life on the battlefield. Avitus is made bishop in a church in the same Italian city where he is defeated. Why was Avitus, the deposed emperor, made into a bishop? So that he would no longer have any military connections or any military power, and so that Rissimer, who deposed him, could say, I didn't slaughter a legitimate Roman emperor. I allowed him to follow a religious vocation which he had always wanted to do. This is the public story. But in the shadows, Rissimer sends a secret assassin, his old friend Majorian, to silence Avitus for good. For Rissimer, holy exile isn't enough. He must have total victory. Italian Romans wanted to protect what they saw as their own interests. With the deposition and then strangulation of Avitus, the emperor from Gaul was out of the picture. And now Romans in Italy could hope that they would go back to the future and that Italy, the source of Rome's original greatness, would once again be 
the source of the Roman Empire's salvation. With the Emperor Avitus finally gone, Italy celebrates. But the mastermind behind Avitus' death has no plans of proclaiming himself as a replacement. Ricimer himself will have realized that he could never survive as emperor. It would have been unacceptable for a barbarian of a uh, barbarian warlord uh, with indeed royal connections to barbarian royal houses to assume the Roman throne. No barbarian leader really contemplated it seriously. Instead, Ricimer names a man he thinks he can control, his best friend. Majorian, the man whom Rissimer decided to make emperor instead of himself, was an Italian. Rissimer had gauged the sense of especially the Roman upper class in Italy. The Roman upper class in Italy wanted an Italian emperor. Rissimer decided he'd be the power behind the throne and make Majorian, that good Italian, into the Roman emperor. Like the Wizard of Oz, however, Behind the curtain, Rissimer was going to pull the strings, or so Rissimer thought. With the new regime, the three old friends enjoy the spoils of power. Rissimer is named Master of Soldiers in Italy, and Agidius is sent on assignment to his native Gaul. Agidius is reasonably successful. We have a number of sources that say very positive things about him, both as a commander as and an individual. So he, he seems to have been he seems to have been a very charismatic um, and uh, successful military commander. Agidius secures his army's camp in Gaul near the city of Soissons, but with the Franks to the north, the Visigoths to the west, and the Burgundians to the east he is trapped in a sea of barbarians. Under constant attack from their barbarian enemies, Agidius and his army rise to the occasion, determined to defend Roman Gaul at all costs. Agidius uh, was a Roman from Gaul, from France, uh, who had extensive military and diplomatic experience. Um, and the Roman hope was that he could prevent further, especially Gothic, uh, incursions in Gaul and protect what admittedly small part of Gaul was still part of the Roman Empire. The endless barbarian assaults take their toll on his already diminished forces but Agidius refuses to admit defeat. At this stage, Egidius in the 450s, there's still hope, perhaps, and he clings on to this view and uh, tries and hopes for a restoration of Roman power. With Agidius in Gaul, Rissimer expects to wield full power in Italy, but Majorian has other plans. What Rissimer discovers is that Majorian has uh, every intention of being an active um, Roman emperor rather than the figurehead that he was intended to be. He tried very hard to push Rissimer into the shadows and into the sidelines, uh, and he tried to take command of major military ventures on his own. Majorian uh, is an emperor who's clearly very dynamic, who is also very efficient, and he's also aware of the deficiencies of the empire, which he's determined to rectify. Majorian devises a grand campaign against the Vandal King Geyseric, leaving Rissimer on the sidelines. This Rissimer will not allow. The alliance between Rissimer, Majorian, and Agidius yields success when Majorian is made emperor, and Agidius gains victories in Gaul. But Rissimer's power as the mastermind is threatened when Majorian strikes out on his own, launching an expedition against Rome's greatest enemy, the Vandals. 
Majorian leads his troops across the Alps into Gaul and south into Hispania to prepare a naval attack against the Vandals of North Africa. Majorian commissions carpenters to build the strongest, fastest ships, hoping to overpower the great fleet of the Vandal King Geyseric. Majorian wanted to drive the Vandals from North Africa to restore the Roman Empire's most important source of food and revenue. Camped near the Mediterranean coast, Majorian takes every precaution for his important and expensive mission. Majorian is, by all the evidence we have, careful. He sends scouting forces across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, tests the waters, if you will, of uh, local support for a landing, because it's going to be a landing operation. It's not exactly D-Day, but it's going to be, by lay Roman standards, a very significant naval action here. But in the night, disaster strikes, despite all of Majorian's efforts. Geyseric's men set the Roman fleet ablaze. Once again, the Vandals proved to be too much for the Romans. They cannot defeat the Vandals. A lot, lots of things, they just collapse uh, before, they even, <laughs> before they even really start in some cases. The expedition really collapsed uh, halfway through, and, and the, the Romans up to that point were winning. If Majorian had been able to conquer Africa, it's quite clear that he would have been unchallengeable. But as it was, the mission was a disaster. The invasion was a disaster. The fleet that had been collected to carry the soldiers across the Mediterranean was burned in the harbor where it was being uh, mustered. Majorian returns to Italy, dejected, his great plan to recapture North Africa ruined. This is a humiliating act in part of Majorian. The way Roman concepts of power and honor worked, this emperor, the last one who really had the capacity to lead men into battle and thereby achieve the the image of manliness is humiliated. Along the same wooded road to Rome, a troop of soldiers rides to intercept the emperor. It is the honor guard of Majorian's old friend, Ricimer. Majorian was the first military emperor that Rome had had in years and years and years. But with the failure of the Vandal expedition, Ricimer, for some reason or other, decided to get rid of him. There may have been other things going on. Majorian may have blamed the failure on Ricimer. Ricimer may have blamed the failure on Majorian. We have no idea. Fifth century writer, John of Antioch. Ricimer and his soldiers arrested him stripped him of his purple robe and crown, beat him, and beheaded him. Thus ended Majorian's life. A messenger carrying news of Majorian's murder makes his way slowly to the far-off Roman outpost of Soissons, Gaul, where Agidius is stationed. It is very bad news for the general. The only response um, that Agidius is likely to have had is that he and Majorian and Ricimer were buddies. They had served together for decades. What does this make him? I mean, his, his legitimacy was his appointment by Majorian, who has now been discredited and killed. I think his future is very uncertain. With Majorian dead, Egidius no longer sees any point in continuing to cooperate with Rissima. And so Egidius simply breaks away. He refuses to recognize Rissima and Rissima's new government, 
and effectively rules his bit of Gaul as an independent kingdom. Agidius must prepare his soldiers. Declaring independence for Mersimer is akin to declaring war. Rejecting Rissimer's rule in Italy, Agidius considers his kingdom of Soissons the last vestige of the Roman Empire. There's no evidence that they're responding to orders from Bricomir or anyone else in Italy. They're on their own. They're, they're, they're completely independent. So the fabric of the empire is now broken down into pieces. In Rome, Rissimer prepares for war as well. But first, he must find a new emperor to do his bidding. This time, there is no dispute. The man he chooses is no more than a puppet, Livius Severus. No one wants to be emperor. It's not a job that anyone needs. The only person who needs an emperor is the generalissimo. He's the guy who needs the emperor. Nobody else needs one. So Ricimer's there and he needs an emperor. So he's the one who appoints the successor to Majorian, Livius Severus. With the new emperor Severus by his side, Ricimer can do as he pleases and nothing will please him more than getting rid of Agidius once and for all. In the 5th century, Emperor Majorian and his two old friends, Rissimer and Agidius, share power in Rome. But when Rissimer has Majorian brutally murdered and appoints a new puppet as emperor, Agidius has no choice but to remain in his native Gaul and prepare for war. After such a personal betrayal, Agidius and his men are ready to do battle with Rissimer. The power alliance between the three old friends has been hijacked, and Agidius is left out in the cold. Maybe he thought he had an understanding that he was a co-player in this game, that there were two generals in charge here, Ricimer and Agidius. Gideus found out that he wasn't, he wasn't regarded as a player. He wasn't consulted, and he lost the third part of the triangle. Now he's on his own. But Rissimer is already making plans to block Gideus' impending attack. With the new emperor, Severus, under his thumb, Rissimer makes a deal with Rome's one-time enemy, the Goths. Rissimer saw this as a really serious threat, Agidius' proposed invasion of Italy. So Rissimer did the smart thing. He made an alliance with the Goths who were in Agidius' rear. Goths, Agidius, Italy. Because Rissimer knew if the Goths could put pressure on Agidius from the back, Agidius couldn't come to Italy, uh, and that's in fact what happened. Just as he has always done, Rissimer commissions someone else to do his dirty work. Emperor Severus proves to be the perfect puppet for Rissimer, happy to allow the war against Agidius to unfold. As Agidius moves his troops south from his kingdom in Soissons, Gaul, he is attacked by Rissimer's army of Goths outside the city of Orléans. These battles begin with both sides roaring at each other, like at the kickoff of a football game. There was an actual word for it. It starts out with a low growl, and then all the soldiers eventually are just yelling at the top of their lungs. Then you throw missiles at the other side. With such a powerful barbarian enemy, Agidius and his troops are hard pressed to gain the advantage on the battlefield. The barbarians uh, were especially good at running at full speed and using throwing axes, which were very sharp with a heavy head and 
either shattering the shield of the men opposing them, or if you were really lucky, hitting them with the ax. But while the Goths are soldiers for hire, Aegidius fights for the survival of Rome. Finally, he claims victory, but the losses are great. In the field hospitals of Gaul, Aegidius and his men recover from the Gothic attack, but he knows there will be more. One down, Aegidius has his hands full, essentially. These uh, deals that Ricimer cuts with uh, kingdoms in his vicinity obviously mean that he has to deal with these. These are going to be his priority. He's going to be busy in Gaul and not be able to detach any forces to invade Italy. He, he just simply doesn't have the resources to deal with it. Desperate to vanquish Ricimer's forces in Rome, he turns to an unlikely source for help. Aegidius sends a messenger south to Rome's most menacing enemy, Geyseric, who, as king of the Vandals, had taken North Africa, the breadbasket of the empire, over 20 years earlier. He sends an envoy to try to strike a deal, and Aegidius must have been very worried about how this deal would be perceived if it got out to be public knowledge. Um, on the one hand, people could see, well, if we can reach a real deal with the Vandals, then we have a real bright future. But on the other hand, what will we have to give up to deal with these people who've taken away the most precious, the richest part of our empire? After traveling through Gaul and Hispania, Aegidius' envoy finally reaches North Africa. In the Vandal camp, the messenger delivers Aegidius' plea. It looks as though Aegidius may have sought to establish some sort of relations with Geyseric in North Africa, from the point of view that they both have a common enemy, that is, Ricimer in Italy. And therefore, Ricimer could be caught between Gaul and North Africa, a potentially very dangerous position for Ricimer. The barbarian king Geyseric could be the last best hope for the empire's survival. Surrounded by barbarians in Gaul, Aegidius is unable to drive his army against Ricimer and the puppet emperor Severus. With nowhere else to turn, Aegidius sends a plea for aid to the Vandal king Geyseric. In Soissons, Thousands of miles away from the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa, Aegidius can only wait for a reply. We don't know for sure, but I think it's likely that Aegidius's envoy reached uh, the Vandals and that perhaps a deal was in the making. Um, we really can't say. Aegidius has run out of time. Assassin sent by Ricimer makes certain he will never fulfill his dreams of a restored empire. It seemed this mission serious enough uh, and perhaps that it was it seemed possible that it was going to succeed, which uh, led Gideus's enemies to finally find a way to undo him by treachery because they couldn't take him in direct battle on the field of combat. With Aegidius out of the way, Ricimer's hunger for power only increases, and his thirst for blood cuts short the life of his puppet emperor, Severus. Ricimer makes and unmakes, through violence, a series of emperors trying to find that front man who would allow Ricimer to really be the power without developing ambitions of his own. The problem for Ricimer was that when he put a puppet on the Roman throne, that puppet didn't want to remain a puppet. But now total power is his. Rissimer's ambition and bloodlust seem to know no limits. For two years, Rissimer rules Rome without naming an emperor. Ah! 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 
and the barbarian vandals continue to ravage Italy. Any alliance they might have had with the murdered Agidius is now as dead as the general himself. As Ricimer sits on his impotent throne, they take the empire away, piece by piece. When the Western Empire starts to disintegrate, it disintegrates very rapidly. In a sense, the Roman Empire doesn't actually fall. It simply splinters away until the title of emperor becomes meaningless. Ricimer's continued failure against the Vandals only makes matters worse. As the Vandals strike against the Eastern Empire's coastline, its capital of Constantinople is finally forced to move against Ricimer before it's too late. From within his protected palace walls, the Eastern Emperor, Leo, devises a plan to save the troubled Western Empire from Ricimer and the barbarian invaders. But it's at this point that Leo realizes that he has to stop the Vandals, and so what he does is he sends Anthemius. Now, Anthemius was the son-in-law of previous Eastern Emperor, and he actually had a better claim to the throne than Leo did. So Leo's kind of killing two birds with one stone here. He gets rid of a potential opponent, as it were, and he provides an emperor for the West, a competent emperor for the West. And Leo has plans for Anthemius's family as well. He sends them all from their home in Constantinople westward to Ricimer's palace in Rome. Anthemius's young daughter, Olympia, is offered to Ricimer in marriage in an attempt to subdue the ambitions of the bloodstained general, while Anthemius assumes the throne of the Western Empire. It seems as though uh, the Western government had uh, nothing against this, and Ricima, who was, as it were, the effective ruler of Italy, welcomed him there and married his daughter, called Olympia. So it looks as though everything was set for a good beginning and things might have gone very well. Ricimer's assumption that Anthemius will serve simply as another puppet emperor soon proves false. The real problem was Anthemius. Anthemius was sent by the East. Anthemius was acting like an emperor and it wasn't always, uh, he wasn't always doing what uh, Ricimer wanted. In 468 AD, with Anthemius now maintaining control in the West, the Eastern Emperor Leo finances a large-scale expedition against the Vandals in Sicily. There is no example of the East helping the West militarily uh, unless their own interests were involved, and almost always it involved the Vandals, because the Vandals had this giant port, they had a fleet, and of course this is what, this is what prompted the big expedition in 468, because they were now actually able to attack uh, the east anywhere. But Ricimer cannot tolerate Anthemius, who, backed by the Eastern Empire, diminishes his own hold on power. And the tradition in the West by this point was that the emperors were merely figureheads, that Rikima uh, made the important decisions, made emperors and removed them and conducted military operations himself, whereas Anthemius was perfectly capable of doing this himself. Filled with jealousy, Ricimer sabotages the attack, assassinating Rome's own commanders, leaving the empire's forces vulnerable whole thing falls apart and then the unfortunately the uh, fleet which is headed by uh, Leo's brother-in-law it falls apart as well the ships are burned everything is a complete disaster after the Empire's crushing defeat in Sicily Ricimer spends months gathering troops in Milan before launching a full-scale attack on Anthemius in Rome
So Ricimer brings in the army and they besiege Anthemius in Rome for nine months until eventually Rome falls. And meanwhile, while the siege is going on, Leo has had envoys sent to him from the West saying, all hell is breaking loose, it's civil war, do something. But there's no time to save Rome from Ricimer's wrath and all Anthemius can do is flee. In a familiar scene, the deposed Anthemius seeks sanctuary in a church. Well, we know that the, the, uh, the besiegers broke into Rome uh, early in July of 472, and that Anthemius's followers scattered. Anthemius disguised himself as a beggar and was caught probably at the shrine of the martyr Chrysogonus. But this time, Ricimer hires no assassin to silence his emperor. On the steps of the Christian altar, he personally sees to the sacrifice of his latest victim, Anthemius. He was executed. I assume it was cutting his head off. That's the normal way it's done. Uh, chances are they probably stuck his head on a pike and paraded it around. Rissimer plays true to form. Once again, with blood and steel, he carves out his place in Rome, leaving only corpses in his wake, bodies as lifeless as the empire itself. Again without an emperor, Rome succumbs to anarchy and violence. Barbarians meet little resistance as they raid the towns of Italy. They go out and they sort of rape, loot, and plunder, uh, attack cities and whatever else, and then come back. And this is what people have to face uh, every year. So it, it's, it's, there's no stability. Rissimer does nothing as the empire self-destructs. He cares only for himself, as always, garnering his power from the empire's weakness. So now there's a peculiar circumstance here. We don't seem to need a real emperor, and it's hard to find a role that's clearly cut out for the commanding officer of the Western armies. One could really question why we have any imperial government at all. This society is slipping out of the structural system that we had identified with the Roman Empire. Rissimer is a man who has built his career and power on the countless dead bodies of his enemies, both barbarian and Roman. Now he is alone, master of an empire in name only. In such turbulent times, even the details of Rissimer's death are fragmented. Priscus, the only source, tells us that he died vomiting copious quantities of blood. Haima pleiston, and that's it. And so we have no idea whether it was you know, an ulcer or cancer or what. With the sources, we have no idea. When the puppet master dies, the Western Empire dies with him. By now, barbarian leaders, whether they were Goths or something else, really had the money and the men to decide the fate of the Roman Empire. And that is exactly what happened in the years after the death of Rissimer. Rissimer's struggle to dominate brought nothing but ruin to the empire he hoped to control. Yet in his absence, its future grows even more bleak. Next on Rome, rise and fall of an empire. After serving in the court of Attila the Hun, a Roman diplomat named Orestes makes his way to Italy, intent on saving the crumbling empire. Only one man stands in his way, an ambitious barbarian with his own plans for Rome. 